Before we get into God's word and the lesson this morning, I wanted to take an opportunity to remind myself, to remind everyone that's here today that we have a mission from God. Amen. We believe that our church's mission is to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to then make disciples of Jesus Christ. And then we ourselves and helping others mature disciples of Jesus Christ. To be, to make, and to mature. We do this in a number of ways, but just so that we can all remember, we believe that it's counterproductive, in fact, many times impossible, to create disciples without doing the following. I'll get to step one in a moment. Step two, we want people to belong here. We want them to be family here. We want people after that to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. I saw an example of this this past week. Leah Stout, uh, one of, a cousin to one of our elders who led the prayer this morning, Alan Trimble. Leah decided that she would step out and share her faith with a gentleman named Jim. Uh, older gentleman than her and her family. And so we want people to belong like Leah. We want them to believe. And then when you share your faith and you help others believe, I find myself standing with Jim, the first one to get baptized in this baptistry this past Friday morning at 9 a.m. Amen to that. We want people to belong. We want them to believe. We want them to be baptized. After that, we want people to be volunteers. We want them to jump in and be a part of the process. We see this happening all over our church. As I was getting here yesterday morning at 10 o'clock, you had people over here in this south foyer with the red, white, and blue ministry serving. You find people over at Jefferson Elementary. There's Clint Hill and Mike Hawkins and Booker Murphy and others helping children, reaching out to our community helping little kids learn how to read. So we want people to belong, believe, be baptized, be volunteers. On the same Saturday morning that people were volunteering over here, they're over here in this first room in our adult education wing being trained. We want people to be trained with the different gifts that God has given them. And then finally, we want, we want people to be sent out. You say, well, that's all great, but Mitch, you said number one. You, we're going to get back to that in a moment. We believe it's kind of tough for people to partake and participate in any of these if they're not invited at some point. Yeah. Inviting them, and yes, even inviting us, ourselves, into their lives. I saw a powerful example of this over the past few weeks. Now I'm going to step off stage here in a moment, and you'll see why. I'm going to conduct a little interview down here. One of my great blessings is to watch the young men and women uh, that one time I was their youth minister uh, continue to be active parts in this church. And, and it's just a rich experience when over 20, what a, 28 years you get to watch that play out. So Drew Harris, come on up right now. I met Drew for the first time. That was Alan Bastier giving you a shout out. I heard Alan. You heard him. Alan, I got this, brother. All right. <laughs> I met Drew the first time in 1990. Sophomore, junior, probably junior. Ended up graduating in 1993. It was placed on Drew's heart some time ago to uh, start up a men's leadership class. I, I could just call it a men's discipleship class. God has put it on his heart for this ministry to continue to grow and expand and involve all of the disciples, starting with the men of this church. But one thing that Drew did, it was placed on his heart, that it was not just for him and not just a, a blanket invitation to everybody, though it is that. All men are invited. But as is very important, when God puts someone on your heart to specifically invite, uh, you, uh, you act on that. Drew, tell us a little bit about that. So one of the people that I wanted in my small group that I thought was important to uh, have involved in this ministry was a, a guy that was in youth group with me. And we were in youth group together. <coughs> Sorry, I get a little emotional here. Um, he was like a little brother to me. 
And um, I wanted him to help me be a better man, be a better Christian. I wanted him to be involved. So I invited him to come be a part of this. And, man, everybody that I invited, they were just like, yes, this is exactly what I need. And I, I feel like that was the spirit leading me to do that and leading them. And so when I asked Matt Noah, he was just like, yeah, I'm all in. But he took it to another level. And I'll let Mitch and Matt tell a little bit about that. Matt, come on up here, buddy. One of the reasons we're down here is Matt has a very active job and has really been struggling lately. Drew, you don't go anywhere. <laughs> Messed up his leg pretty good. And uh, Matt, you know, when you've got an active job and you can't do what you want to do, uh, has been a little bit, you know, bummed. And has been a little bit, as we all can be sometimes, MIA a little bit, missing in action. But Drew sought him out individually, a specific invitation, said, I want you to be involved. Matt, how did that make you feel when he sought you out one-on-one? -on -one? Well, um, I've known Drew for a very long time, and uh, we uh, lost touch for a, for a while, but him getting back in my life and um, really wanting me to participate um, in this church again really um, touched my heart, and... Uh, I've just made it a mission of mine to get back into church and uh, really commit to God again. Amen. Now, what Matt did that was amazing to me is these two were in youth group together. Uh, but a young man that Matt knew, uh, about nine years older than, so never when you were a senior, he wasn't in sixth grade yet, wasn't in youth group with him. Matt gets an idea that we're going to invite this other guy. And Drew says, well, I'm in it with you. So Ronald, come on up here. Now, Ronald is, uh, it was in a monster youth group class here with a guy named Jamie Simmons, Deontay, Mickey Page, Jeremy Robertson, Michael Reese. And uh, so tell me how they invite you. You know, and I'm going to hand you this mic, but it, it wasn't our normal today in our society. It wasn't a text, it wasn't a phone call. Um, taking a lunch break. I was taking a lunch break and uh, I'm eating and I get this tap on the shoulder and I look up and it's these two guys saying, hey, we'd like you to be a part of this men's group that we're starting. And pretty brief, they kind of go over what's going on and I was like, of course. We get a group meet text message and, you know, we set dates and here we are standing before you. <laughs> that easy. There we go. Um, I always get a kick out of Ronald. Ronald was one kid in youth group who thought he could beat me running. <laughs> we're going to race after this. I, you, okay, you, okay, he wants the mic now. So it's about sixth grade. We're in the front uh, lawn at the old church, and Mitch was like, I'll race you. I'm like, ah, I got this. I'm going to beat him. He takes his shoes off, and that's when I knew it was serious. I need to <laughs> step my game up. <laughs> I beat him when he was 12. When he was 13, it didn't work out so well. But, uh, you know, what I want you to see here, church, is if you believe that a preacher announcing an activity to over 1,000 people is going to be any form or fashion influential like Jesus wanted that to be, you're sorely mistaken. It is showing up in someone's life. It's tapping them on the shoulder, and it's saying, hey, we value you. We honor you. We want you. What you see right here is what our shepherds are asking us to do. These guys are being shepherds. They're stepping into people's lives, and, and it does me, it fills my heart so much when I look over and I see these guys. Give them a hand, guys. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you. So that's the sermon before the sermon. And... Uh, Great opportunities coming up. So one, less than one week, uh, the simulcast, the Priscilla Shire, I loved her in the movie War Room, is coming up. Ladies, what a great opportunity not to send a text, not to let this announcement do anything but to remind you that you have the opportunity to show up in someone's day, someone's work week, someone's lunch hour, tap them on the shoulder and say, I want you to come. 
It can be someone who's never been here before, or it can be someone who grew up here, was one time involved, but you haven't seen them in a long time. And the same thing you saw play out over here is something God wants to do through you. Uh, one week from that event, the next Saturday, for everyone, the Kibo Run is just around the corner. Run to the well. April 13th, don't miss an opportunity. We still need 15 volunteers. So you're like, I'm just not a runner. I'm not even a walker. I mean, this isn't my cup of tea. We need 15 of you to show up and work this event. And just by way of reminder, you have friends that don't ever think about going to church ever except for one Sunday out of the year, and it's April 21st. They will think about, they will wonder what it would be like to go to church on Easter Sunday. Let's use that to our advantage. Begin to pray right now. The text is great. The phone call is important. But the one-on-one, -on -one, taking time to step into someone's life and look them in the eyes and let them know you love them and honor them by letting them know they matter and inviting them to come. Church, let's do it. Let's be done with holding back. Let us be people that invite others to come. If you've got your Bibles this morning, please be turned to Matthew chapter 5. We're in the second week in our new lesson series, Upon Further Review. Last week, if you didn't hear the lesson, it's online on our website. I introduced this lesson series by saying it's when Jesus throws out the challenge flag. It's when Jesus sees you living in a way, because you've heard in a way, that, well, Jesus would say this, You've heard this, but upon further review, I say to you this. And last week we broke the ice with Jesus saying, you've heard it said, and not in the Bible ever does God say, hate your enemies. He brings up a cultural bar that people are living up to. You've heard it said, love your neighbors, but hate your enemies. Jesus says, I want you to review that. Because I say to you, and now going to give you a new command and commentary on how you should live. The world says, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. Last week we talked about the detail that Jesus went into. About reviewing that. And living our life under that call. Last week by way of review we talked about number one. A disciple's love is active. It's not a hypothetical. It's not a dreamy, stay in your noggin love. It is a love that prays for, that does to others as it would have done unto it, that goes out and greets, that goes out and blesses, that goes out and loves. A disciple's love is active. Number two, a disciple's love is abnormal. It's something that sets us apart. As Will read moments ago from Luke chapter 6, Luke's rendition of what we're reading in Matthew 5. Tax collectors do this. Gentiles even do this. But you are to be different than them. You are to be a contrast. You are to be an antithesis. You are to be someone that is set apart by your love for others that they, these people don't love you. And last week, what I really found that was important about it is if you jump ahead and go, well, this is the will of God. It's not the will of God. It's much deeper than that. This is about living out the character and nature of God, which, by the way, is the will of God. He goes and he says, you're to love your enemies, not just your neighbors, just as your Father in heaven causes the sun and causes the rain to come for the good and the evil. This is what it is to be a son or daughter of the king. So let's read together at this time in Matthew 5 and 43. <clears throat> you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be, that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the, good and the good, on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. 
For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? In Luke, it uses the word credit, which was read earlier. Again, as we talked about last week, that word credit is charis. What grace, what gift is that? It's almost as if Jesus here is being sarcastic. If you only love those that love you, what kind of grace is that? What kind of gift is that? that? There's nothing special about that. You're to be different. So do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect. There's an invitation here in the tense of the language. You therefore come. You must be perfect. Just as your heavenly Father, as He does these things, be like Him, just as He is perfect, you be in the same way. Now, when Jesus shared this teaching and these Beatitudes, this way to be blessed, He does something that's offensive. He does something that's shocking. He says, if you love your neighbors, you are equal with the despised, cast out, evil tax collectors. You go, whoa, whoa, if I love my neighbors, he's going, yeah, because that's what they do. And if you walk in to certain places, as you go throughout your day, if you welcome or hospitable and greet only those that are in your sphere of influence, in your running group, in your peer group, in your tribe, in your caste, in your, so to speak, comfort zone. If you greet those that greet you, you're like an outsider to me. You're as one who has never known the word or will or the walk of God. You're a Gentile. You're not of God's people. Well, they're getting offended at this. They're being compared to those they don't want to be compared to. Jesus is calling us to engage and initiate and reach out to others. Notice it in Matthew's rendition, loving your enemies. There's, there's no pray for, there's no lend to those who haven't lent to you and don't demand back. He just gets to one example. If you're going to love your enemies, if you're really going to be about the business of reaching out to others, of getting out of yourself, then you need to be prepared to greet others. And here he expands the call. It's not just greet your enemies. It's greet those that are not greeting you. I think the Bible, I think God's Word is aware. I think that God knows us well enough that right about now, when we're called to reach out to our enemies, we begin to rationalize, well, I really don't have any enemies. Well, I had that one, and... They're not really ready to make amends yet. I know that's not going to go well, so why even try? And, and really, we're, we're really not enemies. It's just kind of super awkward, and I give them a stiff arm when I see them. Oh, no, not a literal stiff arm, but they're over there, and so I make sure I'm over here. And when we meet eyes, it's kind of awkward. This may not be someone that you work with. Maybe someone you go to church with. It may be someone in your very own family. It may be a neighbor. It may be someone that you work with. But Jesus here expands it. He doesn't allow us just to go to that one enemy I'll, I'll think about, but I'll kind of procrastinate and rationalize about engaging them. On loving enemies, Jesus brings up this connotation of being people who are outwardly focused, who get out of ourselves and greet others, who initiate, who reach out and connect with others those that are not in our peer group, those that are not in our comfort zone, those that are not in our age group or our demographic. Point number three this morning, continuing last week's sermon, is this. A disciple's love is aggressive. And I use that word, I started to put the word assertive in there. Either word works, but I want to go with aggressive. It's something that doesn't sit back. It doesn't wait for the perfect time. It steps in when everything is wrong, just like Jesus did with us. And it leaves the confines of heaven. If, if, right about now, if anyone, please, and saying, man, this word aggressive, that's kind of aggressive. I don't know what else you call it when you leave heaven 
to come to earth and send your son to the cross for those that are your enemies. God's love is aggressive. It is assertive. It is initiating. It is engaging. And it is to the enemy and it is to all. 1 John 4 and 10, here's a freebie for you, says, This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us first. Dear friends, since this is how God loved us, we ought to love one another in the same way. First, initiating, inviting, engaging, stepping out of ourselves. Another freebie for you, Isaiah 49 and 6. I love this when God just says it. It's too small a thing for you, church. It's too small a thing for you, Israel, to just restore Judah, to just bring back my people Israel. I'm going to make you a light to the nations. And you're going to bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. I praise God that we fill this stage with little ones that we pray for to walk in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But Isaiah 49 and 6 says this, Though that be right, and though that be right, it's too small a thing for you just to focus on these. It is about getting out of yourself and inviting and engaging and being people who share the love of Christ with others. I'm going to ask for another to come up here on stage this morning. Weston, if you would come on up. <coughs> Weston and I had a conversation this past Wednesday night that... Uh, I asked him if he would mind having again with me today in front of a few friends. And so here we are. He has gracious, graciously accepted. Uh, Weston and his wife and his four kiddos, wonderful, dynamic, encouraging servants here in our church family. And the way that that came to pass is uh, State Farm, right? Yes, sir. State Farm, working in his office, Six years ago? Yes, 2014, I believe. 2014. And this guy named Wes LaFleur, who worked with Weston, gets back from a Honduras mission trip. And uh, what does he do? He, uh, he came back, and we always had lunch together. And the first thing he comes, he comes to me just so excited, big smile on his face. And the very first thing that he said to me when we sat down for lunch was, you got to go. So when this work uh, co-worker says to you, uh, let's not hang out in the evening, let's not go play golf, but let's go to a, a you know, developing, but yet in many ways still a third world country in Central America next year, what's your reaction? I, um, hey, well, he went on and told me why, and my initial reaction was, was a little bit of shock. Uh, and fear, to so be he, honest. He, he didn't invite you to come to church here and hear me on a Sunday morning, did he? That's correct. Okay, great, great, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Okay, so let, let's go to Honduras. Okay, so keep, keep, keep going. A keep, little bit of shock. A little bit of shock and fear. Um, the fear came in because as soon as he said, Weston, you got to go, I felt the Holy Spirit confirm you will go. And I was afraid to admit that because of all the unknowns. So what was your answer to Wes? I, I didn't answer him for a while. Several months go by, and every day he talked about it, and he kept inviting and kept inviting and kept pushing mm. because he knew the impact that we could have on those people down in Honduras. So at this point, you've got a job, you've got a wife, you've got two kids. Two kids. And one on the way. One on the way. So you've got stuff to do. Yes. And so not weeks, but months pass till you 
at some point tell Wes you're going to go. Correct. It was, uh, he came back in June, and he was very persistent and, as you mentioned, aggressive um, <laughs> in the invite. And it was in February when I finally uh, confirmed and told him that I was going to go. How, how was that trip for you? Well, uh, it was life-changing, and this June will be my sixth trip in a row. And so the guys that have gone on this trip with you have become not just guys you cohabitate pews with now, but guys that are your brothers in Christ. Absolutely, 100%. There's something special um, when, you, when you work with the, with you, when you work into the Lord with people, and especially in a trip that um, was so much out of your comfort zone, going to another country, going into the remote mountains, um, having a language barrier as well, um, but there is an instant connection with the brothers and sisters that go with you on this trip. And I would say that um, I, just from that one trip, a dozen plus people, I feel like I'm instantly connected closer than a brother to because we serve the Lord together. I want to do one more thing because I know no matter how many questions I try to get to to angle at the next part of this what I want Weston to share with you he's not going to share it so Mark come on out real quick this is what preachers do I love this back part wouldn't be sneaky and so uh, Mark has been with Weston to Honduras and he didn't know this part was coming Mark tell us a little bit about what you see in Weston when y'all go to Honduras if you don't know Weston Roberts uh, you're missing a special light in your life uh, Weston has a, a beautiful loving, uh, patient heart. It's a heart for Jesus and, and a humble heart. And what he's not sharing with you, uh, you said six years, this will be your sixth trip? Yes. Every single year that he's gone, he has organized a, a soccer uh, clinic uh, for these kids. There's about 25 kids in this rural uh, village in Honduras, in the mountains of Honduras. And he puts on a soccer clinic, and there's 25 kids anywhere from the ages of, I don't know, five, six years old up until uh, the ages of 13. And, and as he's here in the States, he's preparing, he's collecting, uh, he's getting uh, soccer balls, soccer cleats, uh, jerseys donated to him. And he'll take two large duffel bags full of this soccer gear, and he'll go down there and not only put on a clinic, but our very last day in the village, he passes out uh, the soccer balls and the, and the cleats and, and the jerseys to each and every one of those kids. Y'all give a hand to Weston one more time. Thank you, Weston. I love you, brother. I hope you're seeing by way of example today how heart touching it is and how powerful it is when someone says right off the bat I was convicted by the Holy Spirit church let me tell you something there's going to be some of you that invite someone to an event at this church and you, you see in a pattern here it's not about just getting them on a Sunday morning in fact that may be the worst route that you can go people today you've got friends that if you invite them I'm off topic. Well, no, I'm right on topic. I'm off my sermon now. You invite them to come here on a Sunday morning, they'll tell you no. You invite them to go to Nebraska and help a farmer that he's been watching on his TV who's flooded out, he'll say, try to hold me back. Be creative. Be aggressive. Seek an answer. And when they tell you no, they won't go. Just like Weston, know that you're not going to take no for an answer that the Holy Spirit is working with you, that God loves that person more than you do. And though you may have no power to change your heart, God does. But notice what he says in Isaiah 49. I'm going to make you a light, and it's my salvation. But in the middle of that, you're going to bring it. You're going to be the one that partners with me to bring this. Church, last point I want to make to you today is this. A disciple's love has the ability to be atoning. That's a powerful word. 
But what else do you call it when it is God's salvation and Him making you a light, but He is depending on you and says, you will bring it. It's too small a thing for you to keep this in your head. It's too small a thing for you to keep this in your family. You have friends and neighbors and family that do not know Jesus Christ. Be aggressive. Be atoning. 1 Peter 4 and 8. Above all, Keep on loving one another earnestly since love covers, since love atones, since love makes up for and handles and covers a multitude of sins. A disciple's love is so much more than redeeming relationships. It is instead bringing others into the relationship with the Redeemer. I can't tell you how many commentaries I read. Church, hear this. We're going to go a little bit deep right now. I can't tell you how many commentaries I read over the past month in preparing for this lesson that talk about you love your enemies and forgiveness steps in. You love your enemies towards the end of reconciliation over and over again. They would title this in their dissertation on this passage, Forgiveness of Enemies. Guess what word never shows up in Luke 6 and in Matthew 5? Forgiveness. Does God care about forgiveness? Yes, He cares about forgiveness. He cares about it immensely. But this passage cannot be relegated to, I will love my enemies so that my relationships with others will be better. Now that is an enormous, huge byproduct and blessing that comes out of loving your enemies. But since God doesn't use the word forgiveness here, I'm not going to use it. It is bigger than that. We cannot relegate loving enemies and reaching out to the outsider so that I will be better in my relationships. Once again, that is a massive byproduct that comes from this. But it is only a byproduct that may or may not come. I love my enemies and I greet others outside and invite and engage and initiate like Drew did with Matt, and Drew and Matt did with Ronald, and Wes did with Wes Dunn, so that they will have a relationship with God. That's the big goal. Now, of course, when that comes, the likelihood of this getting right with them is much more a possibility. Martin Luther King stated this, and this was his hope. I say to you, I love you. I would rather die than hate you. And I am foolish enough to believe that in the power of this love somewhere, men of the most recalcitrant heart can be transformed. Will we be people that reach out and love others? Will we be people who act in ways... Honey, bring me that book that I left on the front row. I'm going to end with this. God is good at giving preacher sermon illustrations. Last Saturday, I'm in Panera meeting with Nathan G. and his fiance, bride elect Lauren, and we're planning their wedding ceremony. Bibles are out, plans are being made to honor God. It was a wonderful hour long meeting with Nathan, who I've known all his life. They get up, we pray together, they walk out of Panera and a tap comes on the back of my shoulder. And I turn around, and in hindsight, my only clue that this was about to go weird was a woman that I have never met is in jet black from head to toe wearing the biggest multicolored Hawaiian flower lay around her neck that I've ever seen. Nothing wrong with that, but just, you know, Saturday morning in Tulsa early, a little bit. And she looks at me, if someone has put prune juice in her bagels at Panera with a face like this, I guess she's about 70 years old, and she goes, I hope you're happy. And then about the time I'm trying to figure out what's going on here, where are the cameras? She walks off. And I'm standing there with the bulk of Panera, because she said it loud, looking at me like, you bad guy. And I go, what in the world has happened? And so I go, I go, miss, 
She just keeps walking. I can't live with this. So I get up and walk to her and I go, are you okay? She goes, I'm fine. She's got the biggest Bible on her booth that I've ever seen. It's that 25-pound version that your grandparents used to have where the whole family tree was in there. Massive Bible. You okay? I'm fine. Right about there, I figure I'm just going to cut my losses. I go, have a great day. And I walked off. I, I, that has bugged me for like a week now. She's probably here in the back row going, I'm going to get you in a minute. <laughs> I, I'd never seen her before. And I'd love to be friends with her. But I don't know if that's going to work out that well. Her statement, I hope you're happy. She didn't do a lot to back that up. I still can't, I don't know if she really meant it. I hope you're happy. <laughs> Or, I hope you're happy. Sarcastic. I, I'm at a loss. When we engage and initiate with others, when we reach out to others, there should be no just hope involved. We should put our lives on the line and our sweat equity on the line to making sure in the Beatitudes they're not just happy, but they're blessed. Martin Luther King says, I'm of this foolish hope that in reaching out to others, men of the most recalcitrant hearts can be transformed. I don't know if they'll ever be transformed. In the book, The Brothers Karamazov, the spiritual leader of the book, the elder, the father, the priest, Zosima, says this on loving your enemies. Active love is a harsh and fearful thing compared with love and dreams. Love and dreams thirst for the immediate action, quickly performed, and with everyone watching. Indeed, it will go as far as giving even one's life, provided it does not take long, but is soon over, as on stage, and everyone looking on and praising, whereas active love is labor and perseverance. But I predict that even in that very moment, when you see with horror that your enemy, despite all your efforts, you not only have not come near your goal, but seem to have gotten farther from it. At that very moment, I predict this to you. You will suddenly reach your goal and will clearly behold over you the wonder-working power of Jesus, who all the while has been loving you and all the while has been mysteriously guiding you along the way. I don't know if your enemy or the outsider will ever be transformed by following the Word of God, but this we know you will be. And it is not simply to the world, we hope you're happy, but instead putting an active, persevering love that does not take a moment that no one will notice us being up on stage. And at times it will appear that as we reach out, they only get farther away. But we believe that the wonder-working power of the Lord has been guiding us all this time. This morning, if we can pray for you, if we can pray for your efforts to reach out to another, I feel this on my heart today. We should make this plea more often. I've experienced a lot this past week with health issues. Some people who have some serious diagnoses, some people who have some serious hurdles ahead of them, if the church and our shepherds, our elders, can pray for you today, or you, like Jim, because of Leah, want to come today and give your life to Jesus Christ, would you come now as we stand and as we sing?